I am an associate licensed professional clinical counselor in the state of California. I see people through our practice here at, at Healthy Minds in Brentwood, California. Um, I see teens, adults, couples, getting more into couples and more into the sex therapy related business. I'm hoping to test and get my, my licensure within the next year and a half. So, you know, knock wood, we'll see. <laughs> um, aside from that, I'm, I'm presently in the PhD program for uh, Modern Sex Therapy Institutes to get my PhD in clinical sexology. Um, working on a project that's related to aging and sexuality. Um, and I, I watched the Jane Fleischman interview that you guys had before. So I was like, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> what would you say drew you to this profession? Um, this is probably my 633rd career in my life. Um, and that's just rounding up. Um, I've been in retail, semiconductors, owned my own business, stay at home mom, uh, you name it, I've I've probably done it. Um, sometime around uh, 2019, 2020, I really started thinking, why don't I go back to grad school and become a counselor? Um, it's always been my calling, you know, and the, uh, as a person who's gone you know, on the other side of the couch, getting therapy for depression and anxiety, you kind of go through this period where you think you're too broken to help anybody. Um, but in fact, all that experience built up to what I'm doing now. And then I spent uh, a couple of years doing during COVID coincidentally. So it was very convenient to do it. Graduated from um, Palo Alto University with my master's in counseling and now pursuing the PhD. And I I, for the first time in my life, and I'm 56, I really feel this is where I'm supposed to be. This is really where I, um, it, it's just the sweet spot of everything. And all those life experiences, all those past careers have really um, led to this moment. I was even telling my sister, this is kind of my coming out video. Um, <laughs> um, it's and it's not, there's nothing in my past that I'm ever regretting because I think all of it was accumulation of um, lessons learned and life experience that led me to this. Um, one of the things that drew me to this um, particular interview and this particular thing was that um, the research that's come out has really, particularly over COVID, um, stressed the connection of people that do CAM. And as a for I, I am a former cam model myself. I was a plus size model who did lingerie. And I, it was so developmental for me, like uh, as a plus size woman in America, you become a non-person um, in, in media at the very least. Um, and certainly, you know, you that reflects back on you, you become a, you, own the stereotype. And when you own the stereotype, it becomes reality. Um, when I first started camming, I, I actually started um, going onto a campsite and just talk to people. I was fascinated by the things that turned people on and, and in different ways. And I talked to people and be, you know, tell me about this. How did you get into this fetish? How did you get into this kink? How did you, you know, why are you camming? And I met dozens upon dozens of cam models out there. And I've gone on vacation with them and visited them around the United States and gone to um, theater shows in the city and <laughs> gone shopping and and learned the people behind the, the cam, you know, and who they were. And at the time, I, for about the first two years, I never went on cam. I was just a viewer like everybody else, but I was more talkative and inquisitive in the chat rooms. And I started getting a following and I was like, these people have never seen me. Why are they following me? And another cam model at the time goes like, well, when you get a thousand followers, you have to go on cam. And I was like, that's never going to happen. Who's going to, you know, nobody knows me. Sure enough, I did. And I think that first um, camming that I did, I think I wore a turtleneck I think I wore a wig. I think I may have had sunglasses on. I, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, I can't do this. I, I am not an exhibitionist. I'm not this kind of person. I don't know where this is coming from. 
but all of the people who I had met over the time and, and formed relationships with just models, people that watched came into the room and I had such a laugh riot of a time, fully clothed, just chatting with people. Um, and then that just progressed from there. And I discovered that when it came to me, I had just uh, come out of a pretty brutal divorce um, where my self-esteem, my self-valuation of myself, not necessarily mentally, but certainly physically as a plus size woman was rather, rather low. Um, and to have people give you positive feedback. And I, I know I saw this in the studies that she did when she was talking about the confidence that both cameras and the viewers would see where they'd say, you know, you see stereotypical professionally done porn, or you see the images in TV, film, media of these skinny people that I, I will never be. I, I think I passed it by and it, I, my body will never get back down to that size. But there were still people that found me attractive, desirable, and that in turn made me feel attractive and desirable. And I kind of came into my own there and with my own self-awareness and self-love. So, you know, so there was <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What you said to me, I've heard in so many different variations from different models and mm -hmm. what it was is that this career also helped you in some ways as mm -hmm. far as connection and self-esteem and confidence really. Mm -hmm. and, well, I mean, and that's for me, uh, you know, I, I know that when I was talking to people, as I said, I, I, I didn't actually um, really do much of anything on camp. You know, literally I, I, you know, had a fun time buying lingerie and really fleshing out who I was. And there would be some titillation in some plane, but um, the conversations that I had with people were kind of also what led me into counseling because so many people shared their personal life. You know, in some ways it, it was, there were, people who were trapped in marriages and I, I I do say trapped in some way or, you know, our own personal trap of, you know, a, a sexless marriage where they would come to the camera mostly just to have somebody talk to them and listen to them and hear what they are saying. And it wasn't sexual. It may have been about their classes that they were taking when they were in college, or it may have been about their kids. And there's many people that I still speak to today, you know, that I met through there where, you know, you, you do meet them. Well, basically at an incredibly intimate moment uh, where most relationships spend all this time building up to this sharing of sexuality and sex and sensuality and intimacy, but I don't know their favorite flavor of ice cream, you know, <laughs> so it's flipped. And I think that that almost um, tears down a lot of the the walls that we put up to show a certain mask to certain people. When you get, you jump and you go into that level of intimacy, there's a much more bearing of your soul and the the fears that you have and the inadequacies that you believe you have. And, you know, and I felt really, really close to so many people there. You know, I was going to tell you so many, one of the things that I admire so much about models is that they they do in a way become like pseudo therapists mm -hmm. for their members and their clients because they're listening without judgment. I've asked so many models, like, what do you think your number one job is? What service are you really providing? And almost all of them say to not judge, to hold a space where I don't judge. And a lot of members have said they kind of use platforms like live Jasmine as a way to get therapy in a way mm -hmm. like that's their stress relief yeah. and these deep bonds that form when someone knows they're not being judged, it's safe for them to share whatever's on their mind or what they desire, their fantasy, which is such a vulnerable topic. It really does create from what I've seen, these intense and lasting bonds Mm -hmm. I mean, I have seen model and member who have 
been talking to each other through the platform for 19 years now and 15 years and 10 years and five Mm -hmm. years. And I think it's when someone holds that space for you to be honest and open without judgment. It is so bonding because there aren't many places in life where you can go and be a hundred percent not judged. It's very valuable. So I can see how this translates into, you know, that experience could really translate into realizing, wow, you really like talking to people and listening to people and Mm -hmm. helping that. And yeah, I always say, I think models are the best, like they could make the best therapists. I think they could. I think that, you know, there's a, there is regretfully this uh, stigma that is associated with sex workers. And I think that it's part of the reason I'm coming out here and I, I, I may lose clients. I may have people sit there and go like, you know, I, I've dated men where I've told them what I've done and they've gone, no, you're not a woman I can take home to my mother or whatever. And which is fine. You know, I think that that's kind of um, the, the, you know, from a counseling standpoint, when we talk about humanist theory, Carl Rogers, the principle of Carl Rogers therapy is unconditional positive regard. For the counselor to view every single person, meeting them at the space that they're at in this point in their life, and just being present. And you do the same thing as a, as a CAM model, um, because, you know, you may come in and, and there may be... Um, a sexual proclivity or a kink that is not your forte, it's okay. Go to the next camera. I'm sure you'll find it. You know, it's there. You know, there's feet and costumes and furries and other, you know, all kinds of different, you know, role play, whatever is on there. For me personally, I mean, I'd be in there and people would be like, you know, you're, you're an overweight woman. And I'd be like, just click the next camera. You know, there's, there's more than enough out there. There's more than enough variety And you'll find the thing that really makes you happy, really, you know, sparks joy to, for Marie Kondo to say, you know, like in a sexual way. And I think that the last great hang up is sexual acceptance of whomever we are. And there are some things that, you know, the, the cam societies and the cam sites do not allow you to do, which is fair enough, you know, and, um, but for the most part, I mean, be you, you know? And I think that, that that ability to sit there and say, you know, in a way that they may not say to their partner or to anybody else that they know in their life, you know, I'm into this. Does that make me deviant? And I'm like, do you feel deviant? You know, that unconditional positive regard. It, Anything can be bad if you do it to excess or you feel that it's bad. You get to make that judgment call. From your perspective of experience and now being a counselor, why do you think that people, and especially now more than ever, I mean, cam sites, uh, subscription sites, like OnlyFans and that type of thing are just blowing up. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people really go to those sites and what benefit are they really getting? I mean, I think everybody goes there for different reasons. Um, You know, I've seen people that, you know, top security can never show their face on the camera in case their employer ever finds out to people that they do this for a living 40 hours a week, seven days a week. You know, this is their and they're making quite good money. And I think that, um, you know, you still see that stigma, right? You know, as after COVID, you know, there was this boom in OnlyFans, right? Because people got laid off from their jobs or got shut down from their jobs, went home and found a way to just, oh, wow, we can be on cam and make money. And when you're in a dire strait, you go like, it doesn't matter how I'm making it. Um, And some people are in that situation. You know, I think that, you know, unfortunately, we still have this stigma of sexuality being this bubble, this tower out there. It's like the Pluto of the solar system. It has its own orbit. It has its own rules. It has its own thing. And it's not yeah. really part of human existence. I mean, there's a, even in the sex therapy business, you know, sex is so critical to healthy relationships. It is so 
amazing to that sense of intimacy and that sense of connection that we would have with another person. The only reason that you're in a relationship is to feel connected to another person. Um, but even therapists go through, you know, marriage and family counseling things and have one class. Um, if they're lucky, they might have two or three. And when I went through my program for the PhD, every single class that I had, I was like, no way, really? No way. You know, because statistics would be coming out with regard to fantasies or why does sex die off in marriages or how many women, you know, what percentage of women can orgasm through penetrative sex? And it's phenomenally low. And here I was like, you know, half a century old going like, why don't we talk about this more? <laughs> you know? um, I think for a lot of people coming to those sites is really based on, you know, finding somebody that accepts you sexually. Because um, there isn't much opportunity to talk about it. Um, even when I'm with clients in here and I'll be saying like, well, you know, I'm a certified sex therapist and they'll be like, oh my God, oh, okay, can we totally talk about that? That's awesome. Almost like there's clean therapy and then there's the other therapy. <laughs> and now we can actually share that. Um, and I, I think in that, that trend, transmission over to that, over that line, that's not the word I'm looking for, but crossing in that line and being able to share that brings the full depth and breadth of a relationship into the, into the counseling space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if they could, you know, again, there's also a stigma with counseling as well. There are some people that may pay out of pocket because they don't want their employer to know. There's the concept of, you know, you're going to be crazy, labeled as crazy. So there's stigmas in both of the, the circumstances, um, but so helpful when they're brought together. Mm -hmm. It's transformative. I think people are wanting and seeking spaces where they can talk about sex. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest things, even in me doing these interviews that I've learned and realized is there are not many places where it's truly appropriate or accepted, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and yet all of us are wanting to talk about it more or know more or feel, understand more and explore more. I mean, you, the presence of a, you on the planet indicates two people had sex. I know. You have children, you've had sex. You know, everybody has sex as a commonality, regardless of where we are on the planet, but we don't talk about it. And and that's a, a big stigma in America. Um, it's very similar to you don't talk about your salary. You know, <laughs> like, there's certain things we don't discuss. Um, I think other countries have a better viewpoint of it or at least a more accepting viewpoint of it. Um, and I can only hope that, you know, part of the reason I got into sex therapy was because just bringing it to the forefront. I didn't have the experience that I had in the five or so years that I was camming allowed me to see the depth and breadth of sexual variety. And so it doesn't particularly phase me. Um, I think that that's the thing that people worried the most about is that you'll say kind of like this and that person's viewpoint will forever be changed on how they view them um that's the advantage of, of being the former cam model is like to say like i've seen it you know and it is it you know it may not be my cup of tea but i understand why you would want to go after that and i accept that and you're still a valuable, loved human being on the planet. And I still respect the hell out of you and would love to talk to you more about it and what draws you to it and what do you get out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is like one of the biggest things that many people are wanting to know is that even if they have a certain fantasy or a certain kink or whatever the case is, they're still a lovable human being. Mm -hmm. What would you describe as sex what is sex anything that brings you pleasure for me uh, that's my definition you know um there i think you know maybe i grew up in the clinton administration right where it was well i did not have sex with that woman I'm like she gave you a blowjob 
like you don't think a blowjob is sex <laughs> so and we discovered how people people's definitions of sex now I, I, sexual intercourse is different than sex to me um sex is sex sensuality and intimacy um being able to you know have a deeper connection you know and unfortunately with women uh women's sex toys that are out these days back in the 70s and 80s it was a dildo period and knowing that 20 25 percent of women are only capable or only 20 to 25 percent of women are capable of orgasming through penetrative sex that means 75 to 80 percent of women will not naturally have an orgasm through penetrative sex are they all wrong are they doing it wrong i don't think so <laughs> so the if a sex toy is a dildo that's why women were kind of like who cares you know and then the sex in the city came out and there was the boom of the rabbit right this was to me was like the blowing the doors off of you know intimacy and sexuality and orgasmic pleasure for women because it said oh my god there's a clitoris you know <laughs> Maybe we should play with that. And then you see now today the um, spectrum of uh, clitoral toys, you know, the little rose that's out, the womanizer, the, all these things where, and that are meant to give women pleasure in a non-penetrative way. And I think that when you get to that point, it's like, okay, great. Just like for men, I can have an orgasm any time of the day I want. 20 times a day, great. The thing that the toys can't do is that connection that you have with your partner. You know, you can't roll over in the morning and talk to a womanizer, the sex toy, not necessarily a, a bad mistake yeah. that you picked up at a bar. Um, you know, you, you can't do the same with a, a fleshlight, you know, in the same way. Um, so it's that connection that to me is tantamount as you get older. One of the advantages of getting older is putting the emphasis on where that intimacy should be, which is that connection with that person. So true. And, you know, I don't know if there's a correlation between just the fact that people who are willing to be interviewed on camera out of our members of life, Jasmine, um, which just mainly a very loyal members, but also older members, but I would say more members, um, that I've interviewed have been older and mm -hmm. many of them, their, uh, wives or partners or whoever have, uh, there's been a divorce or they've passed away or whatever the case is. And I, I can't think of one who did not report that their number one reason for being on the site was for the connection and friendship that they had found in the model. You look at the baby boomer generation and um, frequently they'll say like, you know, well, those are online people. They're not real friends. Um, but you look at millennials and the newest generation. And of course they've got friends all over the world. You know, there's, there's a presumption of connection online in a way with the younger generation like you know i may know 10 people on discord i know all of them they're my friends doesn't matter what time zone they're in um but i you know gen x and gen uh the baby boomer generation we we were like on that cusp of that transition into you know i i still remember sitting in front of the computer going like this person i'm speaking to right now is in england i don't have to wait for the friends and family time on mci's you know phone package where i could call after seven or whatever you're able to facetime somebody you could be in paris you could be in la you could be anywhere around the world and we're, we can see one another um this was the stuff of dreams when i was a kid um so I, I think, and, and you see that, you know, kind of, you know, projecting another 50 years down the road um, where, you know, there might be a hologram of a person sitting in front of me. So I feel that I am having a conversation with them in the room with me. Um, you know, even one of the, the professors that um, I work with is very into sex tech. And what is the next stages? You know, what are the, you know, is there... 
haptic programs that are going to, you know, somebody touches you on your knee, or you're going to feel it in this bodysuit. Or, uh, you know, we already have the remote control of vibrators, you know, where you can be half a globe away and still feel that you're connecting with your partner. So I think this is just a peek in the door, you know, these, <laughs> these rooms that we have. <laughs> this is nothing compared to what it's going to be like when my kids are my age. So when you said 50 years from now for the holograms, I'm like, I think we're two years away from that. <laughs> like, that's yeah. going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, with already with the AI goggles mm -hmm. on feeling like things are near you and with you that aren't um, in reality, I'm sure yeah. that the holograms are on their way quickly. Um, I mean, I think that's the only portion of disconnect that we discovered over COVID. Um, there's so many people that were like, yeah, we can see each other, but it's still not the same as person to person, in person contact. Um, so, how does that get replicated? You know, COVID was amazing and scary and life changing, but I think it was a, a pivotal moment in the ways that we're defining relationships now. Um, things that traditionally weren't accepted in a corporate world, right? Remote work from home would never have been globally accepted had not the pandemic forced companies around the world to send people home. Because they would have all been like, oh, you're just gonna slack off and play with your kids and go shopping and do nothing. But they found people work better from home. So what does that say about whether we need to be in an office space anymore? You know, what, was, what does that say about the, the water cooler being the seminal point of communication for companies? And how do we stretch that out? It's, it's a lot more than just, you know, and you, you look at the, you know, what is it, Slack? Slack is the live jasmine of work. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, but even that would not have had the the rush in Zoom. We see Zoom went crazy right at, at COVID as well. Yes, it did. So this boom of long distance communication and the acceptance of it was not thought of five years ago. Certainly not as accepted as it is right now. So how's this going to change? And you look at, you know, like everybody always says, sex leads the way in everything, right? Was it Betamax or VHS? Well, whatever porn decided, you know, was going to be the standard. So, so it's probably another one of those things where OnlyFans and all the cam sites are, are showing us how we communicate in another 10 years. I think that that's really true. And a lot of people forget that, that sex industry does tend to lead the way as far as our technological advances and what's happening where, you know, from my understanding, being able to pay for things with a credit card online came from the mm -hmm. porn industry, fast high-speed internet came from the sex industry. So that's a really good point and observation. What would you say that you think are some of the bigger misconceptions that we still have mainstream about sex. <laughs> that other people are better and having more of it than I am. I think everybody thinks that they're, they're doing some portion of it wrong. And it's very, very hard, I think, for people to ask for what they want. I, I think that that's one of the, again, another advantage of age is, you know, yeah, dude, do it this way or just go. You know? <laughs> you know, so, um, there's an, even with a married, if you've been married 25 years, right, you've had five kids together, you've seen each other in your absolute worst. Um, your body has changed fundamentally from when you were first dating, from when you had kids, you know, the thing that used to stimulate, you know, I used to love having my breast stimulated, but it's not really that important to me anymore, or sensation has died down, or I had a medical condition where I, you know, I have peripheral numbness or side effects of medication that I'm on now that I wasn't on in my twenties have changed the way I respond. But because there's this, you know, this is the way we always do it. 
you know, how do you sit there and go to a partner and say like that thing that you used to always do, isn't really doing it for me anymore. Can we change it? That, that to me is the, the gap. There's not a lot of people that are comfortable saying, let's try something else or let's explore something else or do something else um, for fear. And I, I, I tend to wonder if it's, are you going to leave me if I change, you know, uh, if I ask for something different? Um, when I talk with people that are coming in, as I said, with that desire discrepancy, one of the things I do is I take sex off the table um, and just get back into the comfort and the, the pleasure in touch where it's not expected to have sex. Um, you see very frequently, especially with moms, and this is stereotypical, but women do carry the load of childbearing where you have um, just touch overload from the woman in the relationship because you're picking up children, you're carrying them, you're holding hands. We're much more touch connected. And the spouse will come up behind and rub their shoulders. And immediately her mind will go to, oh, don't want to have sex tonight. This is how he always warms, tries to warm me up. And if you're immediately going that far and shutting it down right there, that's killing your relationship. That's killing your intimacy that's there. Because Maybe he does because for a man, sex is connection. For a woman, communication is connection and bringing the two together. But so if we take sex out of the problem, right? The, the penetrative sex out of the equation, you can do anything else you wanna do. Then is that rubbing your shoulders as threatening to you know your your plans for the evening? If it's just like, oh yeah. Thanks, hon. You know, and, and being able to bring it back into just pleasure again. If you could give one message to everyone in the world about human sexuality that you don't think the world is getting quite right now, what message would that be? There's something for everyone. And it, it's not this limited supply. You know, you liking the things you like because you like it is is enough reason. You know, if you if you feel like disgust at yourself, then we can work through that. You know, we can find out where that comes from. There's certainly enough um, bias given to us as we're growing up through, you know, familiar relations, cultural relations, societal relations, uh, you name it, that kind of taint the way we see not only sex, but other aspects of our life. Um, and, you know, I, when I'm working in here with people, I, I feel like we're spend the last 60 to 70 years of our life trying to figure out what happened the first 20, um, you know, the, the, the things that stay with us. Um, so I, I would say, you know, kind of that, that acceptance of who you are and, and what you like just because you like it is is once you get there then you start going like okay well what else do i want to do what else do i like about myself um you know i i'm blessed that i get to work with people who daily amaze me with their strength um to look at patterns that they've done in the past uh functional and dysfunctional that they may be and working on them to make themselves a better person than they were the day before. Um, and I think if we all look at that rather than think that I'm broken, you know, I'm a work, uh, we're always going to be works in progress, right up until we're six feet under, that you never finish, never finish. <laughs> Oh, true. That is so true. I, I really, I co-sign that message. <laughs> what do the, what do the, what do the politicians say? I approve that message. I approve that message. I approve that message. Um, I always, I have a girlfriend and she recently was started dating someone who, uh, has recently gotten divorced, you know, mm -hmm. can be a little bit sticky. And she was like, but he's done the work. And I'm like, oh, he finished? <laughs> <laughs> he finished it? How did he do that? And she's like, yeah, he's done it. He's fine. And it's like, well, but like you said, the work is always in motion because yeah. 
okay, just using that example, maybe he's gotten over, maybe let's say all of the pain of the last relationship. Well, a lot of that pain probably stems somewhere from his childhood. And you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there's always work to be done and that's not a discouraging thing. It's an encouraging thing. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting to continue to heal and refine yourself. Um, And, you know, he's done the work from that particular perspective, right? The next person that comes along may have a completely different trauma background or may have a completely different attachment style or might have a completely different, you know, narcissistic mother or whatever, you know, (laughs) and there's a new spectrum of things that you're going to have to deal with, you know, and so then you cope with that. And then if they break up there, then there's something else. There's, there are so many, and you know, I sit there and think like, logically, we're only like a hundred years into real applied psychology, you know, with real methodology and, and, you know, evidence-based practices that we're looking at um, and look at what we've done, but there's still so much more, you know, the stuff that, you know, a, I personally am very deep into attachment styles um, and how we in that first six months determine whether or not we're safe as individuals in the world and where our place is. Six months, you know? So, and then we cope with our, our, you know, how we got love and kept love and want security. I mean, we all just want to be secure and understood and, um, until we can do that, you know, but um, my sister had just spoken to me about a friend who has uh, suicide in the family and how hard the holidays were. And I said to her, just, you know, she's like, I don't know what to say. I'm like, I'm like, just be present. Just, you know, tell them, I don't know what to say, but I'm here to hear what you have to say. And if that's just, just to be heard is everything. I think that's actually something that draws people to cam models so much is just that presence. Yep. And that's something members have said, you know, when sometimes they could be with a family member at dinner and that family members on the phone, not present Mm -hmm. when they're with the model who you kind of have to be present to a degree to engage through the screen. And you know what I mean? Um, They feel like the focus is just on them for that time. And it's so healing to just have someone be truly present with you. Mm-hmm. And even the, I think that, and you see some models that are on there just for the pure thrill of exhibitionism. You know, they're not there to make tokens. They're not there to, you know, this isn't their primary source of income. It wasn't for me. I mean, I was just doing it for shits and giggles, excuse my French, but, you know, um, but it was the people and the conversations that I had with people, you know, just getting to know them. And as I said, I mean, like you, you were saying that some people have known people for 19, 20 years. And I'm like, I, the people I've known, I've known for 10 all around the world, you know, um, still talk to them on a regular daily basis, you know, that <laughs> so, you met when you were camming. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yep. That is what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep. That right there, there is such a deep connection that forms between model and member. Yep. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that, that there, there was, it's interesting because everybody in my immediate family knows that I can't, I modeled uh, on cam. Um, The only people whose opinions I really cared about was my kids. And they were like, more power to you. You know, they're very, you know, do your thing, mom, do your, you know, I don't want to say it, but, you know, <laughs> and I was like, cool. And if they, you know, didn't, they even know about this interview. And I said, you know, people are going to be able to search my name and this interview will pop up in Google. And you may have people go like, dude, what is the deal with your mom? Um, I think part of that is with the acceptance that I have about me, um, you know, coming to the point where I've kind of gone through my dive into authenticity and this is just part and parcel of who I am um you know some people have had addiction you know alcoholism gambling you name it we're not perfect people there's nobody that's got this just pristine life 
by the time you're 56. And so, I know, was mine perfect? No, but it has made me the person I am today. And I'm a happy person in my body right now. Um, you know, which says a lot, it's, it's a lot to get to this, any point in your life where, you know, am I perfect? God, no, I still have a lot of work I want to do on myself. You know, the, the, the thing about going to become a counselor is you discover, you know, it's, it's kind of like going to med school and you think you're dying of every disease that you study there. Well, you go to counseling colleges and you're like, oh, I got this. Oh yeah, I got this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got this. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to keep working at it. So well, I really admire you and I'm inspired by your story and you sharing, you know, this is your, cho your choice to be authentic about part of your story and sharing it and being so real and vulnerable. I think that for me, that is truly inspiring. Seriously. When people live <laughs> honestly yeah, it's hard. I, I think that, and I think that's another, another aspect of why I got into counseling is that, especially for women, um, you know, first we are the spouse of our, our partner, then we are the mother of our children. And when the kids leave, there's this, in addition to who's this person living in my house with me and how do I reconnect to them? But who the heck am I, you know, now that I don't have to go to the, the Christmas plays and the concerts right now, or the, you know, after school soccer matches, what do I actually still like to do? And we tend to lose that in the parenting, you know, the, the, the whole generation that we had right now, uh, Gen X, we raised ourselves. So we were sure as heck not going to do that to our kids. Well, now we're coming to the age of the empty nest and we're like, Hey, what is that? What, what makes me happy? I don't even remember anymore. So I, I, I find it interesting. I, I love just working with people that rediscover their authentic self every day and whether, you know, you know, they're able to start establishing boundaries in their life or they're starting to, to get, get their strength back in themselves uh, just astounds me every day. I absolutely love being witness to it. So it's, it's, it's a great thing. And then, you know, to have people go in, discover their authentic sexual selves and especially as i said with the aging and sexuality that we are still you don't turn 50 and become asexual and it shuts off you know we are sexual you know i, I want to say it's 60 percent of people that are like 75 years old still have sex the definition of that may not be penetrative intercourse that we have stereotypically had but it changes and it's still satisfying and it's still meaningful and enhances lives. You know, I love that your definition of sex, when I asked you, was anything that brings you pleasure. Mm. I think that's so beautiful. And I think that people, if there's, there's a few things that I hope people get out of these interviews, but one of them is to explore and indulge in the things that bring them pleasure. Um, obviously it goes without saying so long as it is consensual. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, just throwing that out there, but. I well, wonder, you know, yeah. I do have a question because the, you, when I, I was talking to another uh, Dr. Daniel Water and he is, was reading a book, the name of which escapes me right now, but in the book, it was talking about consent and was saying that consent is the very bottom bar of what we should be considering, you know, because if you're having sex and you consent to it, is it good sex for you? Uh, you know, there is always that fear, I think, of people saying like, well, I'm into this and their partner's like, yeah, I'm not as into that. Um, is that person then, you know, going to engage fully in this act to please their partner? Or are they able to say like, I, I'm not into that, but I can do this. Or I wouldn't be, uh, you know, adverse to you watching porn with it. Or let's, let's watch it and let's see if there's anything I like in that. Um, I'm an advocate of ethical porn. 
as a, a great way to discover the things that turn you on these days. You know, um, there's uh, X Confessions, which is done by a wonderful director who started off by kind of like doing whisper confessions. You know, um, they'd have a fantasy about you know, sex on a baby grand piano and she'd make these short films with them. And there's now an entire library. It, it's it's almost like erotica because it's not porn porn, but it's, you know, as, as you, we typically think of porn, um, but it's a relationship building. It's the connection is in the video as well as the overt sexuality. My final question for you, well, actually, before I get to that, I want to ask you if there's anything about your work, um, your time as a cam model, the industry, human sexuality, human connection at large, anything that we didn't talk about, but it's important for you to share or you want to share. I just got a message from one of my old mods who just said, how was the interview? Um, so it tells you how I'm still talking to them because he knew about it. So, oh, I'm sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> yeah. Just if there's anything about your career uh, now, your, your time as a cam model or anything about human sexuality that we haven't talked about, but you're wanting to share. You know, it's hard because I, it, there's so many different people that I've discovered on the spectrum of life, you know, from people that are, you know, incredibly free with their sexuality um, to people that are incredibly repressed. And that was their escape was to come into the cam and they would delete the app at the end. They would delete everything that they had so that it couldn't be traced. And I get that. Um, I think for you know, I, I can only speak for me and that was that camming for me was incredibly, incredibly empowering. Um, it was a way to develop self-love for myself, for my experience, for my body, for who I am. And the thing that is always astounding is it's not your body, it's your confidence that you have that people say is the most sexually appealing thing that one has. Um, and I can see that, you know, I, and fortunately it, it pains me to see women, especially young women, judging themselves on impossible standards. Um, I, I'm a fan of Paulina Porskova. She is a model from the 80s that was around with Cindy Crawford and um, all the supermodels of that age. She's now on Instagram and talking about aging and especially as a model um, who was world famous to have her negated as suddenly like not of value anymore because she aged when, as again, aging is a natural process. You know, I'm just older than a younger person, but I'm still younger than an older person. This is part of life. Um, the ageist stereotypes of the dirty old man and the horny cougar are frustrating to, to combat because, you know, it's, we, we should be able to enjoy sex. We should be able to be sexual. And, you know, I was teaching a class on um, sexuality and I was trying to make a flyer and I was like, okay, you know, sexy adults, sexy mature adults. And all of the pictures were seniors walking on a beach, holding hands, fully clothed, um, or like a Cialis ad where they're sitting in bathtubs in the middle of a field, holding hands across these bathtubs. Who the heck thought that was a great idea? I don't know. Um, and then you put like sexy younger people and you've got bustiers and all this other stuff. And it was interesting as I'm doing the studies on this, that there's a certain ick factor when people consider older sex and the, the enormous prejudice against it. Like, you know, ugh, I don't want, I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to think about it. So why? It, you know, you're going to be here one day, <laughs> God willing, barring illness or disease, you know, or, or accident, you will be in this same place. And I want you to be 
sexually happy and satisfied at this age. And if that means using more lubrication, if that means discovering and augmenting with a vibrator, instead of doing the, well, you know, I should be able to, to make her wet enough or I should be able to pleasure her enough that she doesn't need this stuff. Doofus, take the aid, you know, like make it pleasurable. <laughs> um, I, I, and again, that whole, if I, when I, I talk to some people when I'm saying like that, that the statistic of the 75 to 80% of women that don't orgasm through penetrative intercourse, if knowing that means, okay, let's bring a vibrator in to do clitoral stimulation while we're still having penetrative intercourse, and that increases the connection of the two of you and your intimacy together, then wouldn't that like take that pressure off? You know, not knowing that she's, she's not turned on. She's not going to, that's just physically impossible, you know, but here, let's expand this. Let's do it in this different way. You don't have to know all the poses of the Kama Sutra. You just have to be open to trying and, and working with what, you know, your changing body and what means, what brings pleasure. And even if that's not the thing that you think it should be, or that porn told you it was going to be. And to the you know, the statistic that basically majority of women do not, um, orgasm through vaginal stimulation alone mm -hmm. it's explained. And it made so much sense. You know, the, the vagina itself does not have a, a ton of nerve endings. Mm -hmm. It has some, but mm -hmm. that's where babies come from. And so to have any more would make childbirth unbearable. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot, I mean, we have the clitoris, which has 10,000 nerve endings from my understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's only function that we can figure out is just for pleasure. And so that's why scientifically, a lot of women don't orgasm from vaginal stimulation alone is because mm -hmm. nature intentionally put less nerve endings there. Mm -hmm. So that we can give birth. Yeah. Um, and even, yeah, even the, the exploration of your body, um, there's such a, a stigma for men for anal or taint massage or anything like that. And it's like, you have these nerve endings, you know, if, if we could take that stigma away and say like, well, what about pleasure? You know, you may, you may not want to, because you're, you can't get past that. But if we just looked at it as feeling touch, feeling pleasure, feeling, you know, let's see what this is, you know, back rubs, arm rubs you know, foot rubs, you know, it doesn't mean you have a foot fetish. It just means it brings pleasure, you know? <laughs> so what's so different about different body parts? You know, your skin is this enormous sexual organ. Your brain's a sexual organ. Use both of them to the most that you can. Very well said. <laughs> My final question for you is what do you think is needed on either a collective or individual level in order to lay the foundation for a more sexually positive, sexually well society? I mean, I there's a whole, a whole tangent that I can go off on where, you know, it, it's the, you know, religion or people that believe if we get rid of abortion, we won't have abortions or people won't have sex. And we know that this, categorically is untrue. Um, I think we should start with the premise with people want to have sex. You know, granted, there's the percentage of people that are asexual and choose not to get sexual feelings or, or biologically do not get these feelings. Okay. But for the majority of people, they want to have sex and it's a driving factor for a lot of people and will always be. So with that being the factual basis of everything we do, then of course, prevention of disease, use of condoms, prevention of pregnancy, all these other things would then naturally flow if we run with the assumption that sex is meant for what we're not only procreation, but also pleasure. And if we start with that, we can go from there. Um, 
I mean, you look at there's the, the rise of STDs in retirement communities because people sit there and go like, well, I can't get pregnant anymore. So who cares about a condom? It's like, okay, let's talk about what else a condom does. Let's go back to, you know, six, 15 year old sex ed, you know, what else does it stop doing? <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, running with the assumption that retirement communities are going to want to do what they do, you know, cool. And let's bring sex education in that. Let's provide free condoms for senior centers as well as for youth centers. Um, I think that that principle of, you know, just it is something that we have and want in life and go from there and we can make great change. Um, you see this statistically in countries where, uh, you know, advocacy for, um, you know, pregnancy prevention causes a drop in pregnancies because we're open about it. We talk about it. We assume that people are going to have sex. Um, pretending that you can just will it away um, is foolish. That's the hill I'll die on on that one. So <laughs> It's true. It's true. Very well said. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I This was very joy. As I said, I was a nervous wreck. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. No, no need to be nervous. Yeah. I told you it would be like a conversation between <laughs> old friends. <laughs> well, and, you know, it, it, again, I think that if you talk about sex, it doesn't become this embarrassing, you know, neither one of us was sitting here a blush and a flutter when I said clitoris, you know, <laughs> or penis, you know, like, and we shouldn't be. Um, somebody once said that the surest way to stop sexual uh, molestation of children is to teach them the proper words for things, you know, and, you know, instead of having, you know, you know Uncle Ronnie touched my cookie. It's like, you no, know, if, if you came up to me and said, Uncle Ronnie touched my clitoris, I'd be like, oh, hell no. You know, that would give greater direction and, and it would reduce the shame a child would feel yeah. at sharing that. So again, it's just the, these stigmas that people put on things that I think um, keep messing up our society. And they'll probably say that, you know, porn messes up our society. And I, I tend to agree to some extent in the sense that porn lies to us. You know, anybody who thinks that you're gonna have sex with somebody like you have, you see in porn shows um, is, is crazy. You know, I don't think that that's that it helps us either, which is why I, I endorse the ethical porn and with a relationship that is in there and that kind of thing where, you know, STD testing is done and people are protected and they're aware of these things, that kind of stuff. So and it's all it's all natural. We've been doing this forever. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> Literally. Literally forever. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I mean, you know, you we do it. If you're here, somebody did it before you. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciated your interview, your honesty, your authenticity. And yeah, seriously, I think it. This, this was my, like, literally, like I said, this is where I sat there and was really thinking about it. And my sister goes to me and she's like, you've come full circle. She's like that, all that is now coming back and she's like and this is what you're doing you know i'm getting this phd i'm working in sexology i i love what i do with people yeah. um because in, in, in some instances it was really tragic having people go like you know i don't have sex with my partner anymore we just are sexless you know it, it's dropped off and it's that discussion needs to be had i i i I'm thrilled when people bring it in to talk to me about it. And how can we bring sex back in our relationship? Because it is so critical. You know, when I, th I think it was Barry McCarthy that was saying that, you know, when sex is a problem in the relationship, it becomes 50% of the relationship. When it's not a problem, it's 10%. You know, you have the sex and you have your, you know, your in-laws and your work and your vacation and the kids and their schooling and all these other problems that make up that 100%. But when sex is bad, it consumes everything and just, it, it, so that's, you got to work on that first. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Ty. This was wonderful. I'm now going to go. <laughs>
thank you again for sharing your story with us. No, thank you for, for doing it. I, I feel like this was the a turning point in my life. So oh. as much as I liked being on it, I also feel like this was something that uh, I, I need to do. I think if anything, you became even more relatable. That's what people are looking for. Vulnerability and relatability. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.